This week at the Agenda saw a wounded politician turned professor, citizens moving from engagement to political consumers, and the historic battle between the West and the rest. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with the alleged muzzling of Canada's scientists. Watch. Scientists from around the country have staged rallies to protest federal government cuts to scientific programs and the so-called muzzling of government scientists. Even the New York Times chimed in with an editorial last month. Is science being silenced in Canada? Joining us now to discuss that, in our nation's capital, Jonathan Kay. He's Comment Pages editor with the National Post. And with us here in studio, Merdad Hariri, CEO and co-founder of the Canadian Science Policy Conference, Adam Brown, Assistant Professor of Biology at the University of Ottawa, and Chris Turner, author of The War on Science, Muzzled Scientists and Willful Blindness in Stephen Harper's Canada. Welcome, everybody, and Chris, get off the fence. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> Happy okay. to. Uh, John, good to see you in Ottawa again, and guys, thank you for being here around the table. Uh, Chris, I do want to start with you, but just because the book is very much the foundation for our discussion today. The book opens with a protest by lab-coated scientists on Parliament Hill, mm -hmm. summer 2012. That's a pretty rare occurrence any day of the week. What were they protesting specifically? Well, the uh, sort of, uh, I think the, the initial motivation or the, the, mo the most recent motivation for it was uh, the many, many cuts that were in the omnibus budget bill in the spring of 2012. That Bill C-38, which, you know, rewrote the Fisheries Act, rewrote the Navigable Waters Act, you know, changed all kinds of things to environmental protection and monitoring, defunded a couple of very critical uh, research labs. That really, I think, was the, you know, the sort of last straw for a lot of scientists. Scientists, you know, by their nature, not the sort of people who generally get together and, and, and chant in the street, but really, I think that, 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 that moment, that sense that, that, you know, there was just this relentless attack coming at them from a federal government that no longer seemed to want their or value their work really pushed them all out into the street. It's that notion of how unusual this was that I want to follow up on, mm -hmm. because uh, People of a certain age will remember in Ontario in 1985, there were doctors who opposed a ban on extra billing. They went to Queen's Park in their medical coats, and people were astonished. Mm -hmm. They could not believe their GPs were out there protesting like everybody else at Queen's Park. What was the reaction when scientists did this on Parliament Hill? I think it had a similar reaction. I mean, it really did get a lot of attention. It got not just in Canada, but international media attention. And I think because we do think of scientists really as, in, in a sense, this, this uh, sort of cloistered uh, uh, society that, that deals in hard fact, data, uh, peer review. You know, they, they mostly talk amongst themselves and every now and then present their findings to the public and that they would suddenly, you know, leave the lab and very visibly say, you know, we are, we are out here you know, not as, as you know, uh, a partisan political force. We are out here as scientists saying, you know, the bedrock of what we do as scientists is under attack. You know, got a lot of attention. I think it startled a lot of people. And I, and I think it was sort of a wake-up call for a lot of Canadians that there was something extraordinary going on with, with our science. It's one thing to say we scientists disagree with conservative government policy on X, Y, and Z. It is another thing to say this government is muzzling us. This government is prohibiting us from speaking. So let's get some examples here. Give me the most egregious example that you would point to of, in your view, this government muzzling scientists. Right. Well, I think you know, the International Polar Year Conference, which was also in 2012 and, and was hosted in Montreal, uh, was probably for a lot of scientists was, was a pretty shocking example of this muzzling. Uh, what happened was the Environment Canada scientists who were there presenting their papers, talking to their peers in what is very much thought of as a place that, you know, where the open dialogue that's essential to science can, can be carried out. Uh, these Environment Canada scientists were accompanied by Environment Canada media handlers, communications people. And basically, you know, if you had a question on one of the panels for one of Environment Canada's scientists, it had to be directed to this media handler. And, you know, you, you're there with the peers uh, in your science community from around the world. It's, it's your, you're, you're the host country and you have this, this, this sort of uh, media minder who, who is, you know, interfering with the free and open flow of communication in that kind of a forum. I think that was, you know, along with some of the other more you know, smaller individual cases, that was certainly a pretty uh, uh, startling example of how hard uh, this government was pushing message control. But let me follow up. Are, are you saying that, that scientists were directly told you are forbidden from speaking upon threat of what? Losing your job? What? Yeah, there's a threat there without... without I don't know if it was ever made perfectly clear. What was made perfectly clear was you may speak... Uh, you know, present your paper, 
but if there is any follow-up question, if anything uh, from the audience asks you, what are the implications of that? What might it mean you know, to, to society in general, to public policy, that sort of thing? You are not to answer those questions. You are to redirect them to us. I think the implied threat is this will be very, very bad for your career if you, if you step out of line without, I think, it ever being stated quite that boldly. Why do you think this is the government's position? Uh, well, I think more than anything else, they are very much interested in pursuing a policy uh, regardless of, of, of the evidence for or against it. And they would rather not have mixed messages in, in, in the public eye. They, they really, really value central command and control. They, you know, uh, the Prime Minister's office especially is probably the most uh, obsessed with message discipline of any that we've ever seen in Canada. And so to their mind, if it's our government, we don't want anyone putting out any messages under our banner that don't stay consistent with, with what we have said is the policy direction. And we are, then they, they know this, pursuing some policy directions that are quite controversial, that do have enormous potential impacts on, on, on the natural environment, for example. And we know there's going to be blowback if we don't control those messages. Okay, that's Chris Turner. The War on Science is his book. Let's get some feedback now from around the table and in Ottawa, where I want to go first. Jonathan Kay, you've heard what he's had to say. What's your view? Well, it's, it's a very interesting book. I actually had the opportunity to, to read the book uh, on, the, on the, the trip here. Um, however, I think there's a big picture, which I, this has to be contextualized in, which is why is the Harper government so concerned with messaging on science? And I think that goes to, um, you know, a few larger phenomena that are interesting to explore. The Harper government is basically the first Canadian government to exist in the age of Twitter. And it's the first government, you know, you could say, well, it's the most controlling of information of any government Canada has ever had. But because of the technology that has emerged in the last decade or so, it's also the first government that has really had to contend with social media and the fact that if a scientist or anybody else says something that's off message at any podium in the country anywhere, you know, five seconds later, that's on social media. So to a certain extent, the conservative government is simply reacting to the new communications technology. The other thing is, I think um, it's very interesting how much the issue of global warming has radicalized uh, conservatives and their attitudes towards science. Uh, certainly in my journalistic lifetime, it's the only issue that really has created a situation where you have a lot of conservatives who are simply at war with reality, where there's a mainstream consensus on global warming, a lot of conservatives simply reject it for ideological reasons, and as a result, the whole issue of science and scientists has come into sort of um, a suspect odor for many conservatives. And a lot of the policies that are described in the book, I think, emerge indirectly from that general suspicion that science and scientists are somehow collaborating against conservative policies. Hmm. Adam Brown, what's your view on the premise of the book? I think that uh, it's important to recognize that all governments um, ha are entitled to put out messaging, and that's what they do, of course. Um, <clears throat> however, in a democracy, the messaging is, is supposed to be able to be accountable in, on some level, and that the public are supposed to be able to assess the integrity of those messages. So I think it's clear that there is messaging going on here with respect to what the Harper government is saying about science or not about science. but. Uh, let's be clear here, science is not some entity that exists out there uh, between the molecules of nature. It's not some special interest group. It's a process of elucidating facts about the natural world. It's a process of inquiry that tells us about the Earth, its ecosystems, ourselves, our health, the universe. And so really, it's a, it's a process by which we get our facts. And so when we talk about messaging from the government, it's very important to recognize that messaging is supposed to be based on evidence and that the public is supposed to have access to that evidence in order to assess the facts for themselves and to see whether or not the government is accurately representing them. Now, science itself doesn't propose any policies. It doesn't have any opinions. It's just, it is this way. Now, what you do with that information is the next step. If the government chooses not to pay attention to information that is important to Canadians, then they are entitled to do so. But it is up to, it's important that Canadians know that they have made a decision to ignore certain pieces of information. So science is not uh, a picking and choosing of um, facts that appeal to you. It is an overall assessment of all of the information that we have at hand. And your suggestion is that politics is not? And of course politics is not. Of course there's going to be some streamlining of messaging in order to get a certain idea across. But of course it's important in a democracy that we're able to assess where they get their information from and how accurate it is. Okay, let me follow up on this issue of muzzling. And Chris, I want you to respond first to something that was in Bloomberg News. 
This is about a year ago, but it still holds up. Uh, here we go. Our response to media inquiries is exemplary, said Mark Johnson, a spokesperson for Environment Canada. In 2011, Environment Canada received more than 3,100 media calls, he said, citing internal records. Johnson said agency officials, including scientists, completed more than 1,200 media interviews plus hundreds of email responses. Johnson did acknowledge that Environment Canada scientists face restrictions on what they can talk about, but he said the same rules apply to all public servants. Quote, in Canada's democratic system of government, commenting on government policy is reserved for ministers and their designated spokespeople, he said. This is a fundamental tenet of our public service values. Has he got a point? Well, credit where it's due, that is excellent obfuscation. He has skated right past the actual uh, problem and, and, you know, drawn out a barrage of statistics to back himself up. This war on science is not about silencing all scientists. It's understood that the civil service includes, you know, uh, a certain loyalty to the government of the day. Civil servants aren't free to necessarily speak in public about public policy. It's, it's part of, of their job. But the truth is that for, you know, many, many, many uh, generations, journalists, the general public, had fairly ready access to scientists. In fact, in a lot of departments, scientists were encouraged to get out there and talk up their work, to demonstrate, hey, look at, you know, look at these great things that we're doing uh, with all that money you gave us, and, and we're really proud of the work we're doing. What we see now is if you do certain kinds of science, stuff that's pro-industry, things that are you know, in, in sort of R&D and, and technological innovation, absolutely, you, you will be out there, you will be talking, you will you know, get the, the, the full support of government to do that. But as Jonathan says, if your science involves climate change, uh, major environmental disruption caused by industry, that sort of thing, suddenly it gets a lot more difficult for you to speak. And even if you do, and this has happened, for example, with a, a scientist by the name of David Teresik, who was, uh, uh, you know, discovered a hole in the ozone layer over the Arctic, uh, when he finally did get to speak to a journalist at Post Media News, uh, the journalist discovered basically halfway through the conversation that there was an Environment Canada media minder sitting in on the call. Which he didn't know at the beginning he of it. He was unaware of when he went into it. Hmm. Yeah. This notion, though, of, uh, of the selling of the prime minister, or as you talk about it, and I remember reading this book years ago, The Selling of the President, yep. you know, this, is, this goes back to Richard Nixon in 1968. Yep. So it's not a particularly new phenomenon that we want, we, writ large, want to market uh, politicians like cans of tomatoes, right? It was <laughs> no. ever thus. Exactly. Yeah, I don't want to portray this as, uh, I haven't discovered, you know, the atom here. I think what I want to demonstrate in this book is that a, as you point out, that citizens have been complicit in this. I think that maybe we want to ask some questions about the power of this stuff and maybe put some controls on it or at least first be aware of it. And it's, be, it's clear to me, for example, that advertising is far more powerful a medium now communicating to the electorate than shows like this or mm -hmm. the, my profession. So why are we living in a world with no regulations over advertising for politics, like none whatsoever. We don't allow Tim Hortons and uh, Starbucks or Canadian Tire to run ads trashing their competitors, but we seem to think that this is fine in politics. Well, if advertising is this powerful, I think we've got to have a conversation about what, what kind of ads do we want to see and what's, you know, responsible. Mm. You read Michael Ignatieff's new book where he talks about the, you know, he didn't come back for you and just visiting. Yeah. But you can't, you can't really make those kinds of ads illegal, can you? I, my simple, uh, I've come around to this. I think that you need um, the advertising standards of Canada should apply just as they apply to the private sector, they should apply to the public sector. During the 2008 election, Advertising Standards Canada put out a little bulletin and it was like an, an ahem in the middle of the election <laughs> campaign saying, excuse me, what you're seeing right now on TV is not something we would countenance in the private sector. And the reason isn't just altruism. Uh, the reason that Tim Hortons and Starbucks don't go trashing each other is because they'll bring down the value of their merchandise altogether. And I think that if politicians want to go around accusing each other of lack of patriotism, attachment, you know, corruption, and they can't be surprised that uh, the, the public says a pox on all your houses. In your experience, and you were at the cabinet table, this relationship between trying to do the right thing, which may or may not be the same thing as giving the people what they want, how did it work out for you? Well, I would agree with Stuart and Tim that I think um, 
generally speaking, the universe unfolds <coughs> as it should in a democracy like Canada. Um, Overall, we do what the people want us to do. It might be messy and up and down. It may not be, the timing may not be exactly what the people want, but we, I, I, my observation and my experience is we do well, what the public wants us to do. But the public is always divided, so how can you do that? I was just going to say, <laughs> it goes awry when there is a special interest group, for example, that is not looking at the interests of society as a whole, but is looking at their very narrow interests, that at times that is when it goes awry. And depending on the political party and the relationship with that interest group, then uh, they could be swayed to be doing something that may not be in the best interests of society. But I really believe that, that is, uh, those are few and far between examples. I think by and large, when you look at it after the fact, uh, it may be a messy road to get there, but uh, the public usually wins in a democracy. And in your experience in public life, you're not now more cynical about how this all works itself out, given that you've seen how that sausage gets created behind closed doors? Well, there are a few uh, bad experiences, but overall, uh, I've been very honored to have had that experience to actually the AODA, for example, the Accessibility Act for People with Disabilities. That didn't come from a public outcry. That did come from a group of people that didn't have their human rights realized, but it did come with the support of the general public once the consultations occurred and the other political parties. So there are, there are really good examples of really good things that happened. So I try to think of those more than the others. Keith, where are you coming from on this? Well, I'd like to take a little different position on this and perhaps uh, <coughs> I think there is more of a concern on the governance side than uh, perhaps Stuart and the others are suggesting. <coughs> I think in principle what they're saying makes sense. Uh, but I think in Canada, you're now starting to see examples where uh, governments, once elected, uh, perhaps are starting to govern to their base. And their base may be a minority uh, a group within the broader population. I think you're seeing it with the federal government and uh, some of the policies and approaches that Stephen Harper's taking, which may not reflect broad public opinion, but his particular base. And I think you see it in Toronto, certainly with Rob Ford. And you look at this uh, recent example with the Scarborough subway and so forth. Um, I think you have to ask the question, uh, are the decisions that, uh, that he's taking and pushing in city council representing the broad views of Toronto residents or a particular constituency? You know, Tim, I'm going to get you to follow up on that one because that is a charge that I think is most frequently made against conservatives okay. as opposed to people in other parties, which is that uh, you attempt to govern mostly, I guess the way Brian Mulroney put it, you dance with the ones that brung you and you don't tend to worry about anybody else. You think that's a fair rap? I'm glad you didn't use that Bryce Mackesy quote of Mulroney's. Yeah. That would have taken this in a whole other direction. I, I remember that one too, yeah. <laughs> some may say public opinion is that sort of business. But uh, uh, look, I, I, I think, yeah, you do dance with the ones who brung you to a large degree. And part and parcel of democracy is going out to the public and finding a, you're never going to get 50% in this day and age. I suspect you tend to get 40 on the national level who like a certain policy platform and direction. And you go that way. Obviously, during the course of governing, uh, you tend to try to be as pragmatic as possible, but the nature of democracy is, is it does allow you to wash it all out. As Keith will tell you, and as the others no doubt know, there's also all sorts of things now around micro-targeting, looking at special groups, uh, whether they be special interest, normal established special interest groups, or communities of special interest, and, and, uh, and speaking to them and their particular interests. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think that's necessarily something that's exclusive to conservatives. That's just the reality of the realm in which we live. And as long as people understand that realm and understand that if they're going to advocate for ideas and they're going to push policy, they need, need to, to be able to advocate to different interests to bring their ideas forward. I think it's managing pieces of chess on the chessboard. Stuart, let's do a little cross-border comparison shopping here. I've heard it said that in the United States, public opinion forces policies and institutions to change or do a particular thing, whereas here in Canada, it's the other way around. Our institutions tend to push the public towards change. What's your view? Uh, well, that, that, that mostly fits with my view. It's kind of an awkward time to be talking about how American democracy works a little better than Canadian democracy. I don't think I said that, um, and, and, for sure, <laughs> and for sure I don't think that when you look at what's going on down there right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, generally speaking, it is true that the American system creates a stronger link between individual uh, representatives and their constituencies. There is a strong, there is stronger what we would call dyadic representation in the United States, and that forces, particularly the House, uh, to react strongly to the preferences of 
the public, or at least the preferences of the majorities who elected each of the individuals that finds their way into the House. That's much less so in the Canadian case. In the Canadian case, uh, members of Parliament are much more likely to vote along party lines for a whole variety of reasons. We have a parliamentary system in which the executive tends to hold the majority in the House and thus can't be locked out of policy making. Uh, and so you do tend to have a system in the states where public opinion uh, has a little more power. You make an observation here, though, and I'll do another quote from the book, uh, Control Room, this is top of page five, uh, where you talk about governing inside a bubble. You say, I had to stop playing the gentleman amateur. It never pays to pretend that you're better than the game or even to think that an amateur can beat the professionals. Most politicians these days start their careers in their 20s as staffers and then move into elective office in their late 30s. They spend their entire lives in the bubble of the political world. What can you tell us, based on your experience, about what the implications are for that? I'm facing both ways on this issue a little. I went into politics for the first time at 58. One message of that is that's not a terrific idea. You need more time to just learn, learn how to speak, learn how to act, learn that kind of sense of strategic caution and care that I think you need in politics. Uh, you need to, to pull the country kind of into your soul and into yourself in, in ways, and that's one of the good sides. The downside of what I'm saying there about the bubble is that we've got far too many politicians who've done nothing else in their lives at all. They've never run a business. They've never, you know, you know managed people uh, very much. They've never uh, been out in the world. They've never, they're, they're in this cocoon uh, of the hill in Ottawa, and I think that is a loss to our country. Uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Harper has done nothing else effectively than, than being a professional politician. I don't want to knock him, I'm out of the game now, but there may be a narrowing there. He may be less, you know, Mr. Trudeau entered politics in his late 40s, he'd traveled the world, he knew the world, he had enormous experience. Uh, he'd marched on picket lines with asbestos workers in the early 50s. You know, Mike Pearson had been all over the world representing Canada. He'd been a fighter pilot in the First World War. We can only look back at these people with kind of wonder at the enormous human experience that they brought to the business of governing our country. We've now turned the governing of our country, not just Canada, but most other countries you look at, over to f professional politicians who've done nothing else. I think there's a gain in the sense that they're better at the business, but there's an enormous loss in terms of they're just not bringing that human dimension to politics anymore. I hear what you're saying on that, um, but my hunch is Stephen Harper would say the following if he were here. Uh, you remember this time, uh, you talk about it in the book, where somebody asked you, why do you want to be prime minister? And you said, well, it's the hardest job any country has to offer, and I want to see if I can handle the challenge. You have to know that's a really terrible answer, right? Oh, yeah, and I say so in the book. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's why you write yeah. books like this, to say to people, that is a terrible answer. <laughs> I mean, and it's a terrible answer because going into politics is not about meeting your existential challenges. It's about doing a job on behalf of Canadians. And it's possible, you're quite right, that Mr. Harper would have a much better answer to that question. Well, let me challenge you there. Mr. What, what Mr. Harper's an real answer to that question, I'm sure, would be, my purpose is to forge the Conservative Party of Canada into a permanent governing coalition for our country. That is, his goals as Prime Minister are political. In my view, they're not goals for the country. Now, he would argue about that of course, and, and yeah. reject. But ask yourself, what is Mr. Harper's purpose for being Prime Minister? I think the honest answer is to hold power on behalf of the Conservative Party as long as he can. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say yeah, that's half not? the task. <laughs> the other half of the task is he wants to change the country. But the, but the first thing that probably wouldn't come out of his mouth is, I want to understand this complicated job and see whether or not yes. I'm up to it. Yes, yes. Does that suggest, this is a bit of a smart ass question, but does this suggest that you really never should have run for this because your first instinct was the wrong instinct? Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I think that you have to remember, you come out of a classroom into politics. I didn't choose how fast and abrupt it was. I had to learn vertically. One of the central themes of the book, however, is that the answer to the question, what do you want to be prime, who, why do you want to be prime minister, is actually a question about who do you want to be prime minister for. Mm -hmm. And that's important, and it takes you a while to learn. 
Um, and I began to learn, and it happened very quickly. It happened in the first election in Etobicoke Lakeshore. When you meet voters and you f hear their needs, hear their concerns, you learn pretty quickly who you want to be prime minister for. You want to be prime minister for the family that's just lost a, uh, a nephew to gun violence. And you want, to, you want to be prime minister so they have gun control you can count on. You meet a woman at a doorstep whose son has at bronchial asthma. Uh, and she wants something done about the pollution coming off the gardener in the 401. And, and you, you, it becomes very clear who you want to be prime minister for. That's the great thing about democratic politics. My initial answer was absolutely wrong, but believe me, after about three weeks in this business, I began to understand who you want this for. We should remind everybody, I guess, that when, when the men in black met you, it was a much longer range plan. I mean, you got up here, the idea was to be a backbencher, I guess, for a few years yeah, and have sure. a chance to sort of soak it all sure. in. But you got up here, you got in the House, and before you knew it, Paul Martin's gone, there's a leadership convention on, and you're in the thick of something that you thought was still a year or two or three away. Exactly, right? exactly. So you weren't really, you weren't ready, were you? Uh, I, well, I not only wasn't ready, but I had to decide whether to wait. I could have passed on the 2006 election and said, I gotta, I gotta learn, but I had a feeling, a strong feeling. It was, I had a kind of now or never feeling about that. Um, you know, I, I, I say in the book that, that um, one of the things you just have to understand about politics is the crucial importance of timing and fortune and the unexpected. Uh, the politician's medium is time. and. You're, you don't control time. Often time controls you. And I think that was my experience in 2006. I mean, no excuses. I made mistakes. I don't want to blame anybody for how it played out. But that's the thing that makes politics exciting and deeply unpredictable. The thing is, if you look at Michael Ignatieff on paper, you'd say, that's the kind of guy we want in public life. Here's a guy who's seen the world. He's written a lot. He's thought a lot about the big issues of the day. He's been a success in never mind one other country, but two other countries, and he wants to come home. You now get added your name to the list, which includes, well, I don't have to go through all the names here. You know who they are. People who are sort of philosopher kings, but who could never make it in, mm. in politics. What is it about politics now where people who you would think are just the folks we want don't succeed at it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated question. Um, what do I think about it? I think there's some things about being an intellectual and a professor that actively unfit you for <laughs> the job, right? Um, politicians are not interested in ideas for their own sake. They're interested in knowing when an idea's time has come. It's a very different question. Uh, you're not in the business of having interesting discussions. You're in the business of making decisions. I actually found the business of making decisions not agonizing. I didn't suck my thumb too much. I mean, I could make decisions. Uh, I think in my case, um, uh, I've been out of the country a while. Uh, one of the things you absolutely need in politics is a deep, intuitive, almost beyond words sense of your country. That takes time to learn. Um, I didn't, because of the way it happened and the timing, I didn't have time to learn it all. Um, but I, I, I would argue that, that if you look at the list of our prime ministers, we've had some pretty extraordinary ones. Mr. Trudeau was an extraordinary man. There's no set uh, curriculum vitae or CV that's going to fit you for this job. And I hope there never is. I hope we always take a chance on eccentric, odd, unusual lives, because I think that way we'll get better prime ministers. One of the interesting things you tell us, though, is that defeat invalidated me as a politician, but also as a writer and thinker. How did it do that? Well, in the sense that if you, if you get beat, um, you, you, you lose authority. You have to reestablish your, your authority. Once, once I was defeated, uh, I had to get back out on the road and, and uh, show people that I still had some things to say that might, might be interesting. It helped enormously to go back into the classroom. I went into the classroom within three or four months of defeat, just began teaching young Canadians again. And that kind of, you get your mojo back. You just start thinking, yeah, I'm not quite as dumb as they say I am. I can, I can do stuff. And, and so it's been, the last couple of years have been enormously rewarding, in fact. 
It is a battle as old as our country itself between the West and the rest. A battle that showed up evocatively on a bumper sticker in the 1970s, which author Mary Janigan borrows for the title of her new book. And Mary Janigan joins us in the studio now. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Steve. As you look through the history of this time and wrote about it over the past century, uh, I don't know if this is a conclusion you want your reader to come to, but I must tell you, I came to the conclusion that, oh my God, we're still arguing about the same old stuff 100 years later. Did you come to that conclusion as well? Uh, the subtitle said it all. When I started the book, it was, I always saw it as Ottawa versus the West or something like that, mm -hmm. something awkward. And about the second draft, I thought, oh my goodness, in front of me are all of these documents. I've been writing about it. But what happened is so obvious, I didn't see it. It was not Ottawa versus the West. It was the West versus the rest of Canada. And these quarrels have gone on since Confederation, and these resource quarrels are plaguing us today, and they've plagued us for decade after decade after decade. Why don't they ever get resolved? Because we're, if this book has a lesson, it is that we have to come to terms with at least struggle to come to terms with these interprovincial rivalries, certainly around carbon and the export of oil and gas. The, the time has passed where we can afford squabbling about which region has the power, which region doesn't. It has to be handled, and it has to be handled properly from here on in. The provincial premiers have been tackling it through the Council of the Federation. They're not making a lot of progress. But I think if Ottawa came in unilaterally and put on a carbon tax, it would be a catastrophe. The lesson of the book is, it is time that the provinces work together because it's in their mutual economic interest to stop these squabbles. If we cannot figure out a way to get our oil and gas to markets, if we cannot find a way to revive Ontario's manufacturing industry or to do things about the refineries, in New Brunswick and in Quebec, if we cannot find a way to work together to use this resource wealth, I'm not saying we own the uh, Alberta mm -hmm. or Saskatchewan or any province's resource wealth collectively, but if we cannot find a way to work together so we all mutually benefit. In a global economy, that's a whole different ball game. We can't afford this anymore. We could be toast. And, and for those who think that this thing you know, doesn't revisit itself. We just saw it recently, right, with the premiers of British Columbia and Alberta going toe-to-toe -to -toe on this as well. I, it was astonishing to me. In the book, one of the provinces that created the most problems for the three Westerners was British Columbia. It started right at the turn of the last century when British Columbia said, oh no, no, they can't have resource control. They cannot possibly have resource control until Ottawa deals with our problems first. We deserve higher subsidies. We want the return of the railway lands given for the construction of CP. They were a huge barrier to the transfer of control. So Christy Clark starts talking about getting a share of the revenues that Alberta is getting from its resources. Here we go again. And I thought if she knew her history, she'd realize that you cannot ask for a share of the royalty revenue that Alberta is collecting. Indeed, after she won election, Alison Redford said, it's not, on the, it's not on the table. There are no royalties to be transferred to British Columbia. We don't collect money from other resources transferred across interprovincial boundaries. And it's not going to happen. Also, we're not going to start sharing our corporate tax revenue from these resources. Ms. Clark is going to have to find a way to get revenues if she wishes, and she probably can. Hmm. I mean, she's working with the pipeline companies now, so we'll see. But that kind of careless talk publicly for a domestic, a small domestic provincial audience is exactly what was happening 100 years ago. Conversely, when you saw Premier Alison Redford of Alberta early on in her tenure, start to talk about a national vision for energy in a way that premiers of Alberta have not in the past. What would you think of that? I thought that was extraordinary. Uh, she used words like strategy and, you're right, vision. 
There's no program attached to it, no specific obligations on different provinces, but they do have to agree to work together. I think, for example, they're going to have to, eventually, the provinces approach Ottawa because Ottawa has the ability to put, to implement these kind of taxes. I think they're going to have to ask for a, a carbon tax of some kind federally, but they have to do the asking and it has to be devised so that it doesn't harm the regions and it should not harm poorer people who cannot afford increased taxes. It should be generally revenue neutral, but enough to penalize companies that are not taking enough care. That is the Agenda's Week in Review. And you can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.